Hello, and welcome to the Kosh. I'm your host, Timber Smith. It's another week and another great guest. Um, you know, today is a pretty fabulous day. I believe that the weather today will represent fourth summer in Wisconsin. If you know anything about fall in Wisconsin, you know we get the opportunity to have about seven different summers. Uh, today is a pretty nice warm day. I believe we are in the fourth one, or that's just me being optimistic in hopes that there is more warm days to come, which I am totally in that space. Um Thank you all for those who have sent me emails and contact me about the uh, last episodes. I appreciate it. I appreciate the feedback. Um, you know, once again, 100, we always appreciate hearing from you. Uh, the show is for you, about you. And so let me know what we can do better or what you would like to hear or the changes we can make. We appreciate that. Um, this week, I'm super excited about my guest. Like, can I say that again? Like, I'm super excited about my guest. Um, so without further ado, um, this week's guest is Lori Palmieri. Um, hey, Lori, what's going on? Hi, Timber. Thanks so much for having me here. I really appreciate the time. Oh, no, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, those Kosh listeners are going to appreciate our episode today. All right. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a great time. It's, a, it's just a great conversation. Um, can you please share a little something about yourself and uh, what is your connection to the Kosh? Well, my connection to the Kosh currently is I am serving my second term as the mayor of the city of Oshkosh. <laughs> Yay. Um, and I'm proud to say the first uh, female elected mayor uh, we have had, of course, other female mayors who are appointed by previous councils, but that changed, that process changed a number of years back. Uh, so I'm real excited and also honored to have that opportunity. I came to Oshkosh in 2008. I was a transfer transplant um, non traditional student who went back to school in my something in my thirties. Uh, same year, my son went to college and he's just like, mom, you cannot go to college with me. Bruh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I, I, I know that I, I know how your kid, kids are like, nah, don't be messing up my fun. Yep. And, uh, so I transferred, I was trying to decide if it was going to be Madison or Milwaukee or Oshkosh. Cause I had gone to the two year school and, um, seemed like a good value. And also in the middle of that, I met my, at the time, future husband that I'm currently married to. And uh, we met at the Appleton Public Library. Is that right? At a film discussion. Yes. He was on a panel, actually. He was on a panel? Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, 2008, um, 2010 came. I got finished up my bachelor's. I thought I might, you know... Moved to Milwaukee or Madison, but my mom got sick, and she was down in Texas, and we brought her up here, and my husband and I got engaged, and so a lot of things happened that year, and uh, that's how I came to Oshkosh, and now we had, so at one time, we had four generations living here until my mom passed away a couple years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we have my adult children and my grandchildren, although... The oldest of the grandchildren just turned 20, and he just bounced off to college at College of Menominee Nation. So nice. he moved out of the Kosh for Shano for natural resources. I'm real excited for him, but uh, yeah, so that's my connection to Oshkosh. And I, I think the other piece of it was, too, I felt like when I came to Oshkosh, I was studying urban and regional planning, and I was really attracted to a lot of the historic architecture the access to the water, you know, Menominee Park, and uh, just the the kind of physical layout. It's it's very charming. It is. Um, the, my big things, uh, one of or some of the big things, a access to water because a load of fish, and uh, yeah, just having all this water around you. You know, there's people that pay a lot of money to have this type of access to water to live live this close to it, and then um, it travel time 
Like being somebody yes. from a, a, a big city um, where it literally could take you forever to just go uh, from one side of town to the other. And what the what it would take to like go from the north side to the south side here is the difference of traveling from like Fond du Lac to Appleton or something. So I, I think travel time is huge. Absolutely. And uh, the... Um proximity to the Northwoods and also the big city. It's just a, a great kind of middle of the, of the best of those both worlds, right? We are greatly centralized. Um, it was something when I used to uh, be in admissions, it was one of my, like the pitch, the pitch is like, we're centrally located in Wisconsin. Like we're an hour and a half from Madison. We're an hour away from Milwaukee. You know, we're an hour away from Green Bay. Like anywhere you really want to go and kick it, like live, live in Oshkosh because like we're an hour and a half at most away and you can go enjoy yourself at all these other venues. Like I think that's huge. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really a great opportunity. I think, um, if you have a variety of interests and, you know, you've got family or even as a, you know, a young single professional or someone starting out to have that proximity as well as that quality of life that's affordable still yet. Affordability, like that's pretty high on the list. Quality of life, contrast, affordability. We do a pretty good job. All right. You ready to jump into the first segment? I am. Okay, first segment. What in the world is going on with? This is where you have the opportunity to talk about what's on your mind. Start off with the phrase, what in the world is going on with? And tell us what you're thinking. Okay, what in the world is going on with paying more for less in the form of holy ripped out jeans? My granddaughter, like... <laughs> Oh my God. Every parent right now is going, yes. <laughs> and, and I guess I have to use that as the preface and then piggyback on with Instagram and teen girls. And it, it it's the holy gene syndrome with Instagram right now. And I said, well, hold on a minute. Why don't you just wear shorts? You know, um, right? Because it, it's not doing anything for you and it's getting the crisp in the mornings, you know, kind of cool. Oh, no, near so out of fashion. And I do think it came back from the 90s and however many times that's come around that fashion, right? Right. So that's what in the world is going on with that. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, you know, here's the things. Uh, my daughter also, uh, who went through that, uh, I don't know if Holy Jeans ever went out. Like, I feel Maybe. like they've, they've been around. And so like things have changed about jeans, but having holes in them has not. So like high waisted, low waisted, you know, this baggy, tight, skinny, you know, but at the end of the day, they still make them all with holes. And I will <laughs> never understand that holy tr uh, 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 trend because I come from the old school days of corduroys and patches from my parents. Shout out to my mama, uh, where, you know, it, you didn't have no holes in your jeans like that or, or pants or, or anything for that matter of fact. Like there's some things that were acceptable. That was not one of them. I feel like this is a, okay, this is going to sound a little smart alecky, but I feel like it's an appropriation of the poverty culture. You think so? Well, I mean, Go it's ahead. just my, my granddaughter's like, well, nobody wants to look too fresh. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I, okay, that's that, new. I never kind of thought of it that the, way. The, the teen group, and of course the giggly other teenage girls that were with her, you know, they, they're like, no, 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 you can't have too fresh. Yeah, I, I never understood that, and I never understood uh, the skinny jean trend either. And I'll tell you why. Uh, why would I buy pants that's going to cut off my circulation? <laughs> like, I can't breathe. <laughs> Like there's nothing that looks comfortable about it. And not only that, like you're buying jeans for the short term, like good jeans don't get to be good jeans until about year two or three. Right. Mm -hmm. And so 
if you buy skinny jeans and you just have that the, those three, four, five flex pounds that happen every once in a while, you ain't getting in them skinny jeans. So that's the end of them. <laughs> At that, least they did add spandex stretch into them now. Back in the old days, they were cotton, right? Right. They didn't have any of that extra little give. But there is also a limit to that. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's such a good topic. <laughs> All right, my what in the world is going on with has to do with there is this big push right now that we need to be ordering our Christmas gifts now because if we don't, you might not get them. And what in the world is going on with that? But, I mean, I understand what is happening right now. You know, once again, for those who've listened to past episodes of The Kosh, I'm still waiting on my furniture. My furniture is probably sitting out there in said ocean on whatever cargo uh, shipment thing container. Um, and so you I could build it with toothpicks by the time you get that timber. Uh, timber can't build a dam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, God has blessed me with gifts and, and handiness is not one of them. Luckily, I have great handy helpers and people in my life who love me and my family who come over and help do handy things. I'm not even going to front like I am that guy. I'm a tech guy. I'm a nerd. <laughs> well, do you think part of the um, delay or the emphasis has to do with the recent announcement by the U.S. Postal Service that they're adding on days to expected delivery times as part of their new plan, their new um, – I think it was even – even to expect with the first class letter that that it's no longer two to three days, it's more like two to five? Um, that could be. Um, I was just thinking overall, it's probably it's probably not one thing, it's probably everything, yes. right? So yes. like um, the, the worker labor. shortages, yep. labor. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, labor itself, um, the getting stuff made. Um, yeah, you know, production, what, distribution, and... Right, last mile delivery too. Right, it's it's the it's everything, mm-hmm. right? So I I think it's probably a wise warning, but the problem with that is is I don't know about you, but how hard is it to get people to give you a list for what they want for Christmas? And now I gotta ask for this list in October. I can barely get that list in November. <laughs> Sometimes December. So, I mean, right now a lot of people aren't thinking like that, but I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking about like that. Well, I've just started shifting over in the last couple of years to giving experiences because, um, I don't know. Okay, right now there is a massive building of storage units in our city, and maybe not just our city, right? Right. Um, All these storage units open up. Well, why don't you just rent space from Amazon's warehouse and leave it there? Because if you're going to order the stuff from Amazon and then go stick it in a storage unit, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I suppose to me, to me, the you know the studies show you know after six months you're not any happier with that thing or whatever unless it gives an experience or it's part of your experience. So we've been working on doing trips and different you know classes or something that is maybe non-tangible but gives that memory effect and uh hopefully we'll we'll do okay with that because i'm always guessing too at the until the last minute because folks don't want to say what they want i like that um my mom does that uh my mom started doing that years ago um where she she would do cool things like uh if you want to go to that Bucks game, I'll get you these tickets for that Bucks game. Or if you want to go to that concert, um, I'll mm-hmm. hook you up with this con- these concert tickets. So she, and you're right, it it that is a memory instead of having all these items. Um, yeah, and 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 here's the great thing, like that might I get really gift it too. Sometimes, you know, white elephant gifts. Those things are real. The white elephant gift is real. Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but yeah, the, the experience, but you know what? You just gave me something else that I'm going to think about, like on another level. Like I never thought about the class. Like, that's a great idea. Like, um, if someone wants to take a class and I, I don't know, graphic design or, 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 you know, 
uh, podcasting. Hey, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But and there's so many online classes now too, exactly. right? Exactly. Like, what is that one thing called, like master class or? Yes. You know, maybe it's floral arranging or it's birdhouse building or, like you said, graphic design or map making or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the fact that we have that available to us with technology is pretty cool. It is. Um, I mean, obviously, there are still some classes that are in person, but I tried to sign up for the woodworking class at the senior center because I'm over 50 and I can. But, (laughs) (laughs) But it turns out they're not quite open, reopening the wood shop because the glasses, the safety glasses that you have to wear for operating the machinery bog up. And so that's not offered to the um, beginner woodworker like myself for the safety piece of it. They're offering the refresher for those who've already kind of been to it, but something to do with the the safety glasses, which I'm like, okay, I I get that. Can you buy your own? It's, 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 um, they're just having problems with even the safety glasses, just fogging up whatever the standard ones are. At least that's, that's the reason I got, but okay. I'll, I'll wait a little longer till we can, you know, have a few more folks because you got to have people in person right next to you when you're operating a table saw, right? Uh, it's probably a good idea. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. See, I want to build my own Murphy bed. And oh. that's why I want to take that class so bad. You know. Because they're expensive, but they look pretty simple once you get the hardware. It's the building the bookcase thing. Those are cool. I would really, really like a Murphy bed to be able to put. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I got, I got small bedrooms. Murphy bed seems like it'd be an excellent idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, let me know when you go into production. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that seems fantastic. And now, you know what, um, Mary, you just got all in my feelings because now that I know you can start going to the senior sitter at like 50, like I'm, a, I'm like a sneeze away from 50. You done my feelings. <laughs> Well, I keep trying to hint at the Committee on Aging or the Senior Center or the... We need to rebrand the Senior Center because these folks that are 50 and better, right? they don't consider themselves seniors, Mm-mm. you know? It, there may need to be some rebranding there. Yeah, that look, uh, the, the, the mature... Center. I don't know what we should call ourselves, but I'll tell you this. Until I can get official senior discounts, I don't want to be called a senior. Now, when that, when I get to that age where I get a discount, I will be the proudest senior you have ever met. I will walk in places and ask first, do you got a senior discount? Yes. I'm going to do business with you. Oh, you don't? I'm going to have to leave now. You will, <laughs> you will love to see. I'm not 55 yet, so I'm not – because every place has got this different threshold for what is – the senior discount, right? This is true. I'm not, but my husband is 60, so oh. <laughs> he's playing the AARP card he's when we get it. the discount. Oh, See, yeah. That that, yep. that that look, that 5 and 10% adds up. It does. It does. And you'll get all these, like, emails of all these different opportunities. But, I mean, we got to figure out how to pay for our retirement. I don't think my kids are going to help us out. Uh, yeah. I'm not counting on my 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 <laughs> child. Um, she's got big dreams and and yeah, expensive dreams, right? Expensive mm-hmm. dreams. That is facts. Okay, um, next segment: word association. So this is where I give you some words and tell me what comes to your mind when I say them. All right, we got our favorites, and then I change up the last few. All right, first word: food. Food. Oh. So complicated, right? Um, I love our fresh poblanos out of our backyard along with the cucumbers and the tomatoes. And my husband is all into making zucchini bread. Love that hyper, hyper local food. And certainly here, living downtown in the central city, yeah, we got to put up with a lot of noise and, you know, some mischief and, and things that don't always go so well. But we have access to the 
farmer's market and the co-op. So easy. You roll out of bed in the morning like I did this morning. Bop to the farmer's market. Bop to the co-op. Local food. Local food. Yum. And my favorite. Just had a conversation this morning about curry recipes. Oh. And my aunt, um, who was the sole remaining uh, sister of my mother's side of the family, refuses to give her curry recipe and she lived in thailand and it everybody loves it and she just will not share it Mm -mm. and the food co-op uh gentleman who is behind the counter at the hot bar said next week we're gonna start having hot curry so curry and i know one of your former guests already talked about tacos that's number one on my list but curry is number two okay spicy hot lots of veggies lots of yeah yeah no doubt okay I can't get that recipe though, huh? Well, so far I did ask her, she's, you know, talking about redoing her will and all that. I said, don't leave me anything except that curry recipe. Mm-mm. She's like, I got to think about it. Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the old school folks, they sure be protective, but you know what? I ain't mad at them. If I ever get that, that popular, popular recipe, it, I, I'm, I'm going to have to I'm gonna share it. It's going to be locked in a lockbox and somebody I'm going to have to will the key to somebody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I do have to add on there, though. Um, this is kind of like a, a, a favorite nostalgic and that's Roscon, which is um, uh, my father, who was from Colombia, made uh, when I first met him. I was a young adult and he made me this beautiful, beautiful bread with guava and cheese in it. And uh, um, he showed me how to make it. Mine never turns out like his, of course. And he's gone now. Of so, course. You know, but um, Roscon, absolutely. Okay. Um, next words, cocktail or beer? Definitely cocktail for me. Okay. Um, although I did try for the first time ever a blue bobber last weekend with like it was beer with like blueberries in it. Yes. See, whatever reason, beer makes me sleepy. So uh. I'm not a beer person. Um, but um, Bloody Mary, absolutely. And I don't mean a tomato juice and vodka Bloody Mary with a pickle thrown in it. Give me some spice. Give me some Worcestershire. Give me all that thick goodness in a Bloody Mary. And right. maybe throw the salad in there with the glass. That's right. So, yeah, you're good. The five food groups in, in a glass. I'm, I'm with you on that. To me, the secret ingredient is Clamato. Clamato Ooh. because it, it does a good job of kind of giving it the right texture for the bloody. Just thins it out just a touch and has this nice little taste mm-hmm. with it. That's a, for my bloody. I, I love, love it with a little Clamato. And if you are a beer person, I mean, this is both cocktail and beer, right? Because here in Wisconsin, they always give you that beer chaser or whatever it's supposed to do. Facts. And, yeah. Facts. I mean, it's kind of an afterthought, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perfection. I'm with you. I, I, Bloody Mary, uh, the perfect breakfast drink. Breakfast of champions. Sure breakfast thing. of champions. I, I'm only probably a once or twice a month, you know, indulger, but uh I love wine, but my husband is the only person of Italian or Sicilian descent that I know that is allergic to grapes. What? Yes. Bruh. Mm, Not right. Not right. So I can't drink wine by myself. That's just not. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that one. Okay. Um, Streaming. Streaming. Um. Okay, so I'm a recovering cinephile. Um, love, love, love movies. But since the advent of Netflix, which I think we were talking about early adopters, I, I go back, my Netflix subscription goes back to when you would order the DVDs in the mail and return them. Me too. Yeah. Um, movie, highly recommend. Uh, I don't even know if you can get the streaming because I had to order the DVD. D. Um, searching for the wrong eye Jesus. Highly recommend. Southern Gothic rock kind of rockumentary kind of deal. Okay. And uh, but streaming right now for me is um, the Americans on Netflix. 
that that's is, like a spy thing right yeah yeah okay. it's it's um yeah it's kind of weird uh and then i just got one of those trial subscriptions that if you don't cancel it you know you're going to end up having that subscription fee come up for showtime i think it is american rust Ooh, i don't know what that jeff is jeff daniels and i'm um, trying to remember the the other female lead but anyway um that's a new series um yeah it's uh only i think new episodes come on like sundays you know one of those kind of deals that keep you hooked remember back in the old days when you had to wait a week for your next <laughs> installment of yes a, yeah that's that's how they're that's how they're working it yes. um i think uh, everybody's kind of like past the binge um i do occasionally revisit the wonder years and house okay. if i'm like looking for comfort binge winter kind of hibernation stuff replays are okay with me i'm with the replay mm-hmm. i've been um my secret uh happiness show right now lately that i i was I catch in the mornings on my way out the door gilmore girls oh and you know what I don't know what it is about these fast talking ladies with all this wittiness and this little small town and things like that. But to me, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, they do be saying some pretty sharp things on there. So it's the wittiness that gets me, uh, particularly of Lorelai uh, Gilmore and yeah. And just the family dynamics. Like I love a good family show that just has these great characters of family that are so believable. And because, Because they're jacked up like every other family. (laughs) Oh, those family dysfunction series are great, like Parenthood and... Oh, yeah. But, what you know, I kind of wonder, like, what if you did, like, a mashup or, like, Gilmore Girls meets Golden Girls? Or you took, like, I don't know, Big Big Bang Theory and, like, uh, one of those vice crime shows or something like that. Um, I mean, wouldn't it be kind of cool to just see... Like some of that kind of interplay, like some kind of absurd mixture. Take a nice serious show and then throw in like Modern Family. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that would be, I'm sure that would turn out pretty hilarious. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, Shop local. Oh, I think we kind of already covered that a little bit, but um, adding on to shop local. So this is a little story my husband tells and I um, thoroughly agree. His brother came out from New York to visit many years ago and couldn't believe he could walk to Kits and File hardware store and get anything you needed. Mm. And we we're like less than two blocks. Mm. Um, Kits and File gets a lot of my money. Uh, before, I, I will, if I can't get it at Kits and File and I have to go to one of those big box out on the west side, mm-hmm. I get frustrated. I'm going to say, seriously, what can't you find at Kits and File? Right. I, I have yet to go on a Kits and File trip and not find it at Kits and File. And you know what I love? Someone in there knows where it's at. Yes. Like, exactly. I ain't going to know where it's at, but they know where it's at. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, from your canning supplies to, you know, cat. I even I even picked up dog food there once for my grandson. He had his dog visiting and ran out. Um, yeah, I mean, the the service, the people, and you're always going to run into somebody you know in Kiss and File. And for us, you know, like if I can't get it on my bike, if it's too big or something, of course I'm going to drive. But um, I like to be able to just walk or ride my bike over there and get whatever I need. The lawn leaf bags, you know, this time of year, all that. I love that they don't make you feel dumb. Like I have walked in there with some things that I know that they probably wanted to be like, seriously, but you know what? Hey, help me out. Help me out. And they always do. So you know what? (laughs) The biggest, biggest, biggest shout out to kids and file. Um, That by far is something that should be celebrated here in the cash. Cause I also like, that is a staple. That is a go-to. And you know what? You don't realize how bad you need a place like that until you don't have a place like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know that, um, you know, a number of years back, um, there was some talk about putting in like a shop or whatever up at 
the north side. It does seem like we're a little bit limited here, you know, north of the river, east, north and east of the river on some of those things. But, um, you know, pretty much if, if, if I have to go out and, and fight for a parking space or um, on the west side over there, um, I will probably go to that dirty word of Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to save some gas and some of my carbon footprint by not driving to three different places looking for something. If I can push the button and get it delivered, if kids and file doesn't happen. Okay. Hey, look, you got me. You had me at kids. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Heritage. Heritage. Hmm. Yeah. La Hispanidad. Um, what is that? That's a, that's a really good question. What comes yeah. to mind? I mean, yes. it can be anything. Uh, it's just. I'm going to be, you know, a little bit um, self centered here and think about my own, right? Um, we have a, a very blended family um, from all different backgrounds and uh, shapes, sizes, colors, preferences, um, gender identity. It's, it's, but we're all spread out across the country. And I was only with my mother and adoptive father the first 13 years of my life. And then I was with, um, I was in foster care for a while. I was in like five different foster homes and, I am a um, alum of Wilmer, Wilmer Hall in Mobile, Alabama, which was a state children's home, which is where I landed after the foster stint. Mm. And um, the, uh, yeah, our, our family, it's interesting. On my mother's side, kind of German-Irish heritage. You know, she had blue eyes, freckles, fair skin, red hair. Um, and then on my biological father's side, um, from Apulo, a little tiny village outside of Bogota in, in Colombia. And, um, and, and both of them have passed. But uh, the, the mix between um, those two, and, and then I have sets of half-siblings from each of those parents, right? Right. And uh, it wasn't until I met my have siblings from my biological father's side that I was like looking in the mirror kind of thing. Um, you know, same palm lines and same crooked little smile and those kind of, um, things. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, but it's also like, okay, you're not quite brown enough. You're not quite white enough to like quite fit in on either side too. So you kind of walk through, you know, that, that mix a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course I get that, um, you know, with, with my, uh, interracial marriage and my biracial child, um, yeah, no doubt. Um, but I think it's cooler when you don't get to fit in a box. Yep. Absolutely. Checking the boxes are always like, why do I have to check this box anyway? But yeah, I know there's certain bureaucratic needs for that. They need more boxes with more slashes. More boxes, or, more slashes. Or the be ability to write in. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we are we are becoming a very multicultural um, nation. There's a lot of boxes going on. So and a lot of identity politics too, right? Facts. Yeah. Big time. Big big yeah. time. It's like, can we just check human? It'd be nice, right? It would be, you know. But, I mean, who knows? We might end up in some kind of weird evolution with, you know, what we're doing to the planet where there could be AI, human, and interspecies weirdness, but uh, that's a little too sci-fi. Well, you know, the key is this. I don't know if we know what right. what the future holds because, um, you know, you, you've kind of brought, brought up the environment several times and, and – you know, I just recently read, um, you know, I'm always reading articles, um, and I just read an article 
and always listen to podcasts. And I was just listening to a podcast and they were just talking about how short of a time we really do have if we don't make the change. Like our it, it's it's our oh, kids' we're kids. Out of time. We are yeah. out of time. It's our kids' kids. Yeah. Like we need to and the thing is this when people decide to make this change, it ain't a light switch change. Like it's mm-hmm. change we need to do right now. Um and it's the little things. It's all these little things that that recycling and taking the time to make sure you do that. And, you know, we, we need to take a harder look at public transportation. If, if it's feasible for us to get to our places where we can be, we don't all need a vehicle and um, just all sorts of stuff. Right. And um, I was just amazed that this scientist was really breaking down like the signs we've been seeing the signs for years now, right? And the warnings have been unheeded. Right. And it's kind of, you know, I'm hoping it's one of those things like I, the same thing happened kind of with the pandemic. Like they were always talking, you know, you, you had Bill Gates out there like, Hey, Hey, we need to pay attention to like a super bug coming. If there's a super bug, we got problems y'all. Right. Um, and we've been listening, you know, at the most famous person I remember to really talking to to us about that was um, Al Gore and you know Al Gore ain't been in office in a minute right that was Clinton years yeah Clinton ain't been president we done had we're on our there's three presidents since Clinton wait wait, Bush Obama uh, Trump you know four yeah and we we still ain't really we haven't taken it to heart and I'm sure when he was telling at the point in which he was talking about it, that means there was enough scientific evidence that an alarm needed to be sounded at that point, And we've continued to ignore. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, I, in my, uh, first marriage, I was, um, out in California in the eighties and we had just come back from being stationed over in Germany. And so, um, some of the things that I learned out there in the eighties that we needed to deal with during some drought periods and that, um, and you know, power outage, this, this kind of thing, like that's over 40 years ago. And, and, and when you come kind of to the Midwest and you kind of settle into this kind of comfy complacency and, um, now we're we're just starting to like get some serious conversations and in action because the time for talking is over it, it's time to take that action and uh you know your carbon footprint i'm not i can't point any fingers at anybody because we've done some things you know my husband and i share a vehicle i'm the driver in the family he's the walker in the family um but my day job, I do delivery driving. It's a gas vehicle. Well, that next car needs to probably be fueled differently because right. of the number of miles that and the emissions that you know I'm doing as part of serving the the, the public, but also the greater public that is the planet. Right. I mean, every time I put on another thousand miles, I'm like, oh man, I'm just feeling really bad. But um, we do need to stop talking so much and, and like, start doing. And uh, so hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a little a little more. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I would feel, for word association, I wouldn't feel appropriate if I didn't at least throw in local government. Yes, local government. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Local government, okay, I was kind of an accidental candidate. Um, My husband had served, and I was uh, working on my master's degree, and I was kind of starting to work with some of the the neighborhood folks on kind of reclaiming our neighborhood in in different ways. And I was like the go-to person. They're like, oh, you need to run. I'm like, me? No, I I don't do public. I don't do speaking you know but um then I was like well why wouldn't I why wouldn't I you know I'm a mom I'm a grandmother I'm a recent you know college graduate and um I have the opportunity to do this 
And so everybody should, I think, serve in some capacity, whether it's a local board or commission or committee, or I don't care if it's the Girl Scout troop. Um, Facts. To to get that experience of, of sharing and being part of a greater voice, right? Because it's the local action that's going to save us. It's, it's not going to be the greater, you know, federal, right. national, no. global, no. anything. It, right. th- that action takes place locally. And, you know, I know it's kind of memish to, um, was it, uh, um, think global, act local, you well, know. That, all, all go, uh, what is it, all politics are local or all governments absolutely. local? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and when people say, Oh, I'm not a, I'm not into politics. Well, if you're alive and you're a human being and you live in a, a populated area, yes, you've got some politics going on. Uh, well, even if you're in the, a rural area, right? Yeah, every everything, everything, anything. If you if you want to complain about that pothole, <laughs> or the you know the wolf um, hunt or the PFAS in the water right. or your uh, you know the frequency of your bus routes. You know any of that? It's it's politics. It is um, policy is is is. I think when people say they don't want to like be considered political, it's like they don't want to be associated with the the negativity that comes out or the bureaucracy, right? Because it's right. it's like banging your head on a wall trying to figure out how to get through some of our um, processes at either local, state, or federal government, right? It's complex. I've it learned it, it. There's a lot of layers to it. Um, I think it was intentionally built to be super slow. <laughs> I'm going to take it from the aspect of that's supposed to be positive because it's supposed to be uh, the change that happens is supposed to be change that's built to last and it's not supposed to just be um, on the whim of a wind. And so I can, there's parts about that I can totally appreciate. Um, I've definitely grown a greater appreciation with it. Uh, of local government in my my newer capacity, but I mean, I, I used to, I've always paid attention to it um, overall because I, I understood its importance. Um, well, and I mean, I think that you know, it's people like yourself who've been willing to um, you know get on some of the committees or commissions at the local level. You know, sometimes local government can can be perceived that oh, it's all tied up, it's all predetermined and all of that, and, uh, you know, why should I bother or why should I vote or why should I say anything? Nothing's going to change, but that's not true. We can give a number of examples here locally where people have gotten to the table and, and lent their voice to things where there have been change. Right. So I think things that make sense, you'd be surprised how other people will back that up. Mm-hmm. If it makes sense, and it's for yes. the good of the people be surprised when others are like oh yeah <laughs> that makes so much sense yeah so um it's nice when the ball can move all right um i gotta throw in one more uh mm-hmm. even though we're we're over my word limit um halloween because i'm just curious sarah is there halloween what do you think of when you the word halloween ah <sighs> hmm it's not my favorite holiday no no I have to say, it's not my favorite holiday. Um, and I don't know. I think it's it's kind of a seasonal, like, transition that I'm, I'm not a native Wisconsin. Um, uh, I didn't grow up in Wisconsin. I moved here 25 years ago from the south. Okay. And uh, so big adjustment, and um, I deal with that seasonal affective disorder. So I have to deal with the you know, light box and making sure I'm getting extra vitamin D and exercise so that I don't like, you know, sit at the table, slip my wrists and my Cheerios. So yeah, I, it, do you know, that's real, that, is. that whole adjustment, like, mm-hmm. you know, I actually have one of those light boxes. Like they are, and, and this is the time of year when the days are getting shorter right. and I have to start using them a few minutes. Cause you know, it is almost like a drug. If you use that light box too much, if you wait too long and then you, you can actually get jittery and, and like overdose on the light stimulation, or at least I've experienced that, it, that I have to do it gradually. Mm-hmm. And I can't wait until February when it's the worst of the worst. I have to start in October, you know, oh. and, uh, but I guess Halloween, like the, the holiday, the, the costumes, um, 
You know, I love seeing the kids have fun with it. Uh, but it's it's just, it's not my favorite. I, a um, couple of years ago, did a kind of a mad scientist little haunted porch kind of thing where yeah. we did like black light and some funky little things. So like, and that was a year, because we don't get a lot of kids trick-or-treating in our neighborhood. Okay. Quite honestly. It, it, we just, we lost a lot of younger kids when Lincoln School closed. Oh. And the families are just now here in the recent year or two kind of coming back with the small kids. Okay. Um, but um, it, it's kind of that signal that, okay, we're getting ready to take the deep dive into hibernation. Oh. So I'm, I'm not as celebratory with Halloween. Okay. That's good to know. What about you? You like Halloween? Uh, I'm, uh, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, there was a time I really liked Halloween. Um, I love it for the kids. Um, grew up on it. Definitely took my daughter trick or treating. Uh, and then it got to a point where I used to go have libations during trick or treat. <laughs> so I had my own trick or treat, and that went on for a number of years after my daughter got past the trick or treat age. Um, but I haven't dressed up in a long time in a while now. But this year I kind of have a costume in mind. Because, you know, new job, we're thinking there might be a, a, a Halloween dress-up day. And, and so I've been, I've got this costume in my mind, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go for it. Are you going to disclose this, or is it still cooking up there? No, 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 I'll tell y'all what it is. It is Forrest Gump. I'm going to okay. do Forrest Gump. <laughs> See, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How you you just bust you, out with the? Bro. She just bust out in but, full laughter. He didn't have like any. <laughs> what do you mean? He yeah. totally did. Forrest Gump. Okay, okay, you want me to give you the costume? Yeah, tell me uh, what okay. the costume is. So I'm gonna have a nice little suit with okay. a nice little Skinny plaid. Tie. Uh, well, no, I'm gonna skip. No, no, because no. if you actually pay attention, he doesn't really wear a tie. Oh, that's right. So it's it was a plaid, just a button. It was right. just a button shirt. Button up shirt is plaid, right? With a bubble gump shirt or bubble gump hat. Okay. With some Nike Cortezes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a ping pong paddle. Oh, oh ooh, now you got me on the ping pong. And a box of chocolates. <laughs> okay. Girl, I got you. <laughs> yes. You feel me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I forgot about the bubble gump hat. Yeah, and see, that's one of those movies where, like, I loved it, and my husband hates it. And, oh. you know, it gets replayed. Sometimes there's, like, a Forrest Gump, like, marathon or something. Yeah, on one of the they games. play it all day. It's like the Christmas story almost, but, yeah. I talked to some people in my office, and we were talking about we should dress up as different versions of Bubba Gump, or uh, as Forrest Gump. Okay. Right, because there's, like, young Forrest. Yes. Right? There's army Forrest. Yes. Right, True. and then there's like the end of the end of the story for us. Uh-huh. There's, uh, you know, there's there's probably about three, you know, that's running for us. Yes, you know, run, like there's run. literally, well, no, not even that one. The one where he went oh, for the run, like right across the country with the beard, with the beard, right? Yeah. So, yeah. like, literally, there's probably five quality versions of Forrest. So, what if we? A group of us dressed and then up. And you lined up in the chronology in the different costumes. Exactly. Oh. I'm going to be forced at the end, sitting on the bench, telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, what made you decide, what, what made you think of Forrest Gump, though, as the, like, as your breakout dressing up? I, I just, you know... There's certain movies that when you, when they're on, you just kind of just sit there. Yeah. And you just end up just watching it. And I don't care if you watch, if you start Forrest from the very beginning or if it's got 15 minutes left, you just kind of like, because it, and what I really appreciate about it is this historical aspect to it, right? Mm-hmm. So almost every time you watch it, there's something. You pick up something else, yeah. You, you pick up something else. Mm-hmm. And as I have learned more about American history, I pick up even more. Gotcha. And there's just... Forrest Gump covers, even though That's theoretically true. it is a love story. Sure. It covers so much of American history on, on so many levels. Didn't you just want to slap Jenny? You just like, come on, why, why are well, you doing well, this to him? Well, Jenny, Jenny, Jenny had I know she had her, her she, issues. Well, Jenny, Jenny went through some things, she right? Did. I, I ain't mad at Jenny. 
You know, I ain't mad because. How could she do that to him? You know, you don't, sometimes what you don't know what you got until you don't have it. Yeah. Right. So to me, it was a real love story. Yeah. Right. But that man loved her. That is true. That man loved her. So that, that's the one thing that was stayed 100% about it. So I could appreciate that. Mm-hmm. All well, right. I, I guess the only, only other closeout thing I would say about Halloween is it kind of creeps me out. Like the masks. Okay. Like, like grown up people walking around in masks. Okay. You yeah. remember a couple of years ago they had the whole clowns all over the place? Yes. Right? Yes. My granddaughter, who's 16 now, and this probably would have been when she was like eight or nine, she was terrified. And, and they were staying up in Nina at the time, and there was one of those who was floating around in the, oh my goodness. But yeah, I kind of, I love seeing the kids in their costumes and doing the whole candy thing. And, but yeah, it kind of creeps me out with, with some of the adults who walk around with a full yeah. over the head mask. Okay. I can appreciate that. Mm-hmm. There's some wild people out there. Yeah. Okay. Next segment The Kasha's Hidden Gems. Oh, I was really looking forward to this one. There's so many. Okay. There's so many. I mean, maybe it's not hidden. It's like hidden in plain sight, but um, Sheldon Nature Preserve out by Oakwood School. It's this beautiful little forest, right? Speaking of forest, no pun. <laughs> um, um, Bruh. <laughs> you know, you've got... Um, your, your your trees, your stream, your wildlife, and it, it's like a beautiful little half hour or hour meandering right on the edge of town. Okay. And then um, if you want to venture out, you know, say 15 minutes from here, there's the Walk-On Nature Preserve. And that has got some incredible terrain and, and variety, like, you know, hills and steepness and water and woods and mosquitoes and ticks and all that fun stuff too <laughs> but um uh those those little pocket hikes that if i don't have time or if my husband and i don't have time to get up to you know further up north like we'd like to venture out to the state parks or um you know the the national forest or those kind of places or even further parts um it's nice to be able to get out to these little outskirts and in even in the city i'll say uh hidden gem is um we'll take our kayak and put in over on the other side of the bridge um trying to think that little park i can't think of the little park's name uh it's not rainbow park is is that red arrow i can't remember but you can you can put in there and then you can kind of kayak up this uh you know little little watershed stream and you'll pass the Garbage Hill area. I think it's, is that called Glass? I'm trying to remember. I get I get the names confused. But um, you'll eventually end up <laughs> where you're at Highway 41. And it's all mm. rocks and it, there's, it's too shallow to like kayak anymore. Um, but I, we thought that was a, a cool little middle of the city, like kind of hidden secret. Uh, to to put in your kayak and, and go up there, um, and then um, I think everybody is pretty familiar with the wild wild wash, but that's just me. I I know not everybody knows there's you know that great little stretch there at the university that goes along the river and through the woods, and um, yeah, we've got some some really cool recreational opportunities. Whether you um, walk, bike, run fish swim and and again that's that's another i think opportunity here that not a lot of folks think about is oshkosh as this kind of recreational hub and you can pretty much you know if you're if you do have a boat or or something else you can you can get all over the place yeah um biking out to sheldon last weekend i was like i don't know you know we got to cross highway 41 at the roundabout on our bikes. And that makes me a little bit nervous. Cause you know, we've had some folks who don't pay attention to the bicyclists, mm. but it wasn't bad. Right. I have to say we took highway 21 and it was, um, you know, early enough in the morning on a weekend where there wasn't a lot of traffic and 
and we were able to get through safely, of course, but you just got to choose that path carefully, I think. Once again, quality of life Mm -hmm. for cost of living is so high here. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. What does the Kosh need? Okay. What the Kosh needs in terms of physical um, amenities, in, in my opinion, is two things. Central City Park Space. Okay. We are deficient in the amount of park space considering the population distribution. So Central City, we're northeast of the river, over half the city's population lives in 54901. Right. Okay. Okay. And um, we need substantial amounts of park space for kids. I mean, you got, for example, over 1,600 kids that live in less than a square mile in Census Track 5, and they're not a 10 minute walk to Menominee Park. Right. Right. Um, or, um, um, you know, a couple of schools are closing that those spaces are not available and they're not always like really available on the, you know, outside of school hours either. It's kind of a perception thing like, oh, that's not really park space, but central city park space. Um, I think everybody, whether you're a senior, you're a youth, um, there's like over 330 families that live downtown that don't have cars. So it's not like they're going to pack up grandma and, you know, the twins in the stroller and um, get over to Menominee Park in 10 minutes. Right. Or South Park. Um, So so that's one thing. And then my secret desire, a roller rink with the disco ball. I think we need a roller skating rink. Oh, I would just like it. It's coming back. Oh, it totally is. It totally is. You know what? I was, it's funny because I've been thinking about it a lot. Like there's been a lot of videos of, of roller skating rinks, uh, on, I don't know, uh, Facebook or whatever. And, and, um, it made me actually hope that, um, the, the family that owns the rink in Nina might reconsider because right now I just think after COVID we need those kinds of activities back Are available. They um, well, I don't think they've been open for a while. Okay. Right? Okay. And I'm sure they weren't open during yeah, COVID. Yeah, last time I was there was taking my granddaughter to a birthday party probably right. three years ago. Yeah, it's it's been a while. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know how consistently they're open. Right. Um, but there's just something cool about that, right? Yeah. Um, and it, and even though I by far am no great skater, and uh, I don't think anybody in my household is you very good. Skate? Uh, uh, and not without injuries. <laughs> 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 I, there, there would be a valid attempt, and I would wear a helmet. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> so no, I I'd love that if we could get one in Oshkosh. Oh my god. I've always been, there's not enough kid things right. in Oshkosh. Exactly, especially for that tween to teenage, right? Yeah. Like, you might find some things for the 12 and under, but that 11 to, like, yeah. 17, there's not, I mean, yes, there's sports. There's sports. Yes, there's Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, right. if you've got memberships, right? Right. right. Um, but affordable and to give them the like independence of being able to get to and go to these things too is I agree. I agree. I know our neighbors sat around a number of years back and were like, we need a children's museum. You know, we, we need something like that. And everybody says we need, but, but when it comes down to like, you know, making it happen, that's, that's where the trick is. Right. Right. I like that. Roller skating rink. All right, somebody, some entrepreneur out there. We and need. it has to have the disco ball. All right. And play disco music. Oh, we, well, <laughs> a, a, a disco night. Well, somehow yeah, you ain't getting disco the night. Glow, you ain't, They have glow bowling. And you that, ain't getting the kids yeah. on them nights. <laughs> well, well yeah, maybe, maybe mature kids. I was just going to say, maybe there could be like an adult night only, you know, like yeah. primarily for youth, but there's some of us who are young at heart who could still – Handled skates. That, okay. All right. I'm scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we're going to move into the next segment, uh, the Naughty Slash Heroes Corner. It's your opportunity to nominate someone, something, uh, organization, anything to either corner or both or however you want to do it. Uh, what, what's on your mind? Oh, this has got me hot this week. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Ooh! The Naughty Bruh. List goes to... Drum roll? Do I? You got a drum roll on there? Oh no! Uh, uh, all right, uh, but but you know what? I get. I do got. All right. <clears throat> the Wisconsin legislators, who in their infinite wisdom decided to um, put forward this ban on discussion or education uh, regarding anything that would make anybody feel uncomfortable in terms of race or intersectionality um that just blows my mind just blows my mind okay like that's that that's one of these topics where i'm just like you know what let's just not teach history anymore like i because you know what don't think your traditional history doesn't offend others Mm -hmm. so maybe i don't want my kids listening to that yes so if we're going to play that game and I'm and I'm a huge component of fairness, right? What is good for goose is good for gander. If you don't want your kids to hear certain parts of history, I think we have every right to make the law or our kids to not hear parts of history. I think we let's nix it. Let's just nix history. Optional. We don't need to. We don't need to learn any of the pedagogy of America pledge of allegiance and patriotism, because that might be offensive to my kids. Yeah. Let's, I mean, if that's where you want to go with it, because the fabric of our history, good, bad, or indifferent is the fabric of American history. It should all be taught at the point that you think that you have the power and privilege to dictate those things, that means every American gets the power and privilege to dictate those things. So don't be surprised when what you find to be just good old fashioned traditional Americanism, historic uh, history gets attacked also when others are saying, you know, maybe I don't want that taught to my kids because I think it's offensive. Mm-hmm. So, well, and sorry, that was my soapbox. No, 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 I I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm, I'm just kind of floored and and, uh, frustrated that even the, the, I think the first round of that or draft of that bill that I read was even talking about even uh, some of the local units of government being able to give like diversity, equity, inclusion training, and they didn't call out like critical race theory specifically, but they used a lot of similar things and um, that they would somehow draw back their shared revenue. I mean, this was in the initial draft. I don't even know if it made it into this last round of this mess, but it's like, wow, wow. That just, it floors me, but it, 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 okay. You know, I think when people draw these lines, um, cause I think you need to learn about America, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Like you just, it's America and, and, you know, don't be ashamed of what the history of it is. You know, it is what it is, uh, you know, but we, we want to pick and choose what we teach. Then all Americans should get to pick and choose. And then when no one knows anything about the country, don't be frustrated. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It will change what the dynamic of, of, of what unifies us looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Woo. That's a hot one. I said, I told you, I was like, that, that one just, oof. You know, Kosh listeners out there, I would love to hear what you think about that. You know, please feel free to email us at askthekosh at gmail.com. I, that, you know. Let us know. What do you think about that? How do you feel about um, government control of American history? That is that deconstructing 
Yeah. yeah re, well, yeah, well, it is a reconstruction. Well, I mean, history is already through reconstruction. Omission, right? Through omitting it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it it's already gets constructed because, you know, history is written through the eyes of, of, of the victor. <laughs> so it's already, it already has its slants, but now we're really taking it to another level. So, okay, I would love to hear what you think out there. I'm curious. Uh, so please feel free to share, you know. We, um, there are no hard feelings in that. Want to hear from all sides. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, anything you want to add to that? I think that's enough for now. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. You caught me off guard. I was like, whoo, that was, I wish I could remember what the, the, the number of bill was, but I was like, this isn't good. I actually listened to the public hearings, um, on Wisconsin. I, or, um, uh, this has been like maybe not even a month ago, and I thought, okay, this is so far gone. This is not going to make it. This is this is not going to see the light of day. And then I kind of like I didn't forget about it, but I was just like caught off guard that that this passed the Senate. Now I, I'm assuming, you know, Governor Ears will end up vetoing this, but it it just yeah it just caught me off guard and just. Got, I had to start taking my blood pressure medicine again this week. Okay, when you find out what that is, um, I think uh, let's put let's put it in the podcast notes. What what um, what was that brought up under? Was that an? Um, let's see here. Let me look up the bill. Okay, so because well, we can get you could come back or just let me know what the bill number is because uh, you know I think it's an um, an informed public. It's important to be an informed public. So what we could do is we could just put the bill number so people know what we're addressing into the podcast notes. All right. Sounds good. All right. Okay. On to the topic of the week. All right. Once again, as you know, the the guest uh, gets the opportunity to choose the topic of the week. Um, and this week's Topic of the week is how to be an accidental climate activist. Okay, I'm pretty excited about this. All right, Lori, Lori what do you got? So I am uh, gearing up for my first uh, keynote speech at the university. Um, there's an event coming up in act, uh, here next week um, called Earth Charter. And, and the Earth Charter is this pretty magnificent, kind of manifesto that has been around for uh, quite a number of years. And actually, when I was um, in undergrad, I worked on the Earth Charter, like, organizing committee for, um, you know, getting speakers in. So uh, I'm guessing they're um, kind of low budget here because they asked the mayor to come and be their, their keynote. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because I'm really excited about it. But I've been chewing on this, and it's like, okay, what do Gonna share here or what what am I going to engage here um so okay this is this is where we're at if you want to save the planet and you want to mitigate climate change and carbon emissions and these kinds of really it seems like oh diffuse responsibility oh that's that's up to somebody else you know I can I can do my little thing here, and, and somebody else will take care of that. No, if you want to save the planet, stay in your parents' basement as long as you can. That's what I'm saying. Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to explain that. I know, right? As somebody who's trying to make sure that the, the, my, my young, the young person in my life is going to break out on their own. So you Okay, know. well, and, and, and I use that kind of more, you know, as an attention getter. But the, the truth of the matter is I got, I got one that's a boomerang back at home. Um, we've kind of had a revolving door of, like, say, multiple generations and intergenerational household, and I didn't grow up with that. Um, but some of my other family members have, and, and I've been able to connect with other cultures who that is part of their tradition, right? Right. And... Uh, it's interesting because I've, I've been reading about this one particular study, I think it comes out of Australia, where it says, even though it wasn't intentional that 
this intergenerational kind of dynamic of co-housing um, was desired. It was maybe through accident or by circumstance that they found, you know, maybe you had uh, a young adult who went through divorce or whatever and moved back home with mom or, um, you know, for economic reasons, a temporary kind of, uh, like boomerang situation or whatever. But the interesting thing was, even though it wasn't necessarily intentional, the energy and carbon emission savings of these intergenerational households can save up to 60% of carbon emissions as a result of energy savings. Really? By, I mean, if you think about it, you're all using the same heat in the house, right? True. Okay. Um, maybe, uh, you're not buying as many microwaves or pieces of furniture, the building materials, right? Right. Uh, that it takes consumption wise is also, you know, a big contributor. And so by sharing the space and, and whether or not it's your parents, your grandparents or friends, Co-housing has the opportunity, number one, to solve two problems. Not just climate impact, but we've got a housing shortage, an affordable housing shortage too, right? That's that's so true. And, and, and so even if you're not a tree hugger, granola muncher, like I'm sort of there, I won't say 100%, you may be interested in making a difference because I hear a lot of young people say you know I want to do something with my life that makes a difference and um, if you think about it we have the silver tsunami of folks who are you know aging and and I think the numbers don't quote me on this are, are you know in that doubling period of folks who are going to maybe have some issues with being completely on their own over the next 10, 20 years, right? And um, we've seen from the great pause, I call it, last year, how social isolation for elders and young people, that that division. Right. Now, how do you solve that space-wise, right? Because, like, a lot of people went into what they called the bubbles or the pods or whatever. I mean... There's an opportunity here to solve kind of a housing shortage on a, on a short term, but on longer term, reduce the carbon footprint. You know, low carbon living lifestyle doesn't mean you have to drive the expensively, you know, um, hybrid or electric vehicle or, uh, you know, Tesla or something along those lines. Although I think we're, we're probably going to be seeing that much more here in, in the coming years. But on a small scale, these other choices, these everyday choices, and shorter term can can add up quite a bit and reduce. And so there there are a number of studies out there, and in this particular one from Australia that, is, that I've kind of honed in on is about intergenerational co housing. But again, there are interestingly enough, the the U.S. was kind of leading this because there was a, a British. Uh, study that I was looking at who was referring to the U.S. is doing more of these what they call intentional co-housing communities right and that that can be in a different uh, a, a number of different formats whether it's you know owned condominium type situations or like little intentional communities of individually owned place but they share you know communal space or communal things and and we've seen mutual aid networks right and, and I know that's a little squirrel path here for me, but over the last year, just pop up in response to COVID where people were, you know, sharing goods or services or, or needed items in response to a crisis. We can do it. We've seen it happen. Right. So really it's about thinking about what you can do, not getting like depressed and, and down and out like, the planet's boiling. I can't do anything. No, these these small acts of intentionality, as accidental as they might be, can really add up. 
And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and preach about, oh, don't fly, don't eat meat or any of that because that's everybody's indi- individual decision. But certainly those, those, those small acts of um, accidental activism. And I, and I think even if, you, even if you look at some of the, I'll call it the tactical urbanist movement, guerrilla gardening, you know, places where there's been blight or neglect where somebody just kind of tosses a little seed bomb in there uh, and then it, you know, <laughs> grows into this um, edible thing. You know, right. there, there are many different ways to, um, you know, not sit there and commit your life uh, to 100% um, devotion to battling climate change, to just like work things in and still live your life. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. I, you know, I understand it, it may not sound very popular because we, we want folks to become independent, but there are ways to work it out. I mm. mean, you know, yeah, there's the whole, you know, privacy thing, and then there's the whole uh, time Right, because you might have different rhythms. Young, oh yeah. In our house, Absolutely. for example, the younger generation, they come up later in the day, and they're up till way late at night. Right. And then there's kind of the you know how how much noise you can call it, tolerate or right. who's doing meal prep and who's doing this chore, and it's different with an adult child living at home. Uh, they're no longer a child, right? We 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 got a contract signed, you know. This is the rent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that. There's a contract. There's an adult child contract. Yes. Mm-mm. And um, you will contribute in this way or this way, and, and like you will it. invest in yourself. The thing that got really dicey was the different views about safety measures, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And this is where the co-housing intergenerational thing is a little weird, right? Because right. younger folks may not have been as serious about some of the safety measures that some of us who were the 55 or better were a little more concerned about, or even those who were the octogenarians in terms of safety and, and who's more likely to recover. So that, it it's not perfect. Right. It's not perfect. But it is, uh, I think, as we've seen families of choice develop, and again, I'm going to call them those pods, because uh, it's not always going to be your immediate family. But, Correct. But there are options there that you certainly can, we can. We saw the emissions drop last year mm-hmm. when folks were staying home. But not everybody can stay at home. You, you still got to have folks going out there, doing the deliveries, right. doing the building, Doing the healthcare, public safety, but you know we can do this. We have shown that. So you know what are those lessons learned? And there's cultures right now that do do that. Absolutely, they, Absolutely. they do it and they do it yes. effectively, and and it works. And they're not about the whole. Okay, I'm gonna call. Okay, think about daycare, right? Mm-hmm. Between child care and senior care and school and our offices it's all about the stages of human warehousing for different periods of our lives okay yep right you're right yep it's human warehousing (laughs) uh it's just a question of where and when right but if you're able if you have the privilege or the opportunity to bring folks together, you may be trading off child care or senior care. Who's working? Who's bringing home the bacon or veggie bacon, whatever, right? <laughs> um, to solve some of our own community problems in a way that does not divide us from in, in that social isolation as well as collectively problem solving at the local level for the global impact. You, you know, as you talk about this, it makes too much sense to me in, in an economic sense of childcare is crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Age care is crazy expensive. And a lot of people could possibly, they help each other. And if there's this centralized unit, they won't need the age care and they can help with child care and there's a huge savings. Right. Right. Because instead of all of that money, you keep that money inside building of the generational wealth, building generational wealth. And, you know, when you think about it, I'm not even going to lie. You know, what came to my mind, Dallas. Dallas, the, the show, show, the old TV show Dallas, oh, because I never everybody got into it, but I know it was popular. Well, I'm just saying because everybody lived on South Fort. Oh, yes. Everybody <laughs> lived on the ranch. <laughs> yes. JR, everybody lived oh. on the ranch in the yes. big house. Everybody lived there. Right. So and everybody was, got a job. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because if you look at some of the models that are out there that are I'm going to call them the intentional co-housing communities that may or may not necessarily be relatives, but okay. the intergenerational things. You know, you might have young folks in um, high school, college, or just starting out. They want to be um, in, in a nucleus, uh, you know, a, a heart of a community, but it may not be affordable. And, I, and I'm thinking more about, the, like, the East and the West Coast or Chicago or whatever. But then you have some folks who are, like, 50 or better getting up into – let's say 70, 80s, where they don't really want to go to assisted living. Right. You know, that cruise ship kind of all-inclusive that doesn't turn out to be what, you know. What you think it is, I right? mean, there are some good ones, don't get me wrong, but the shortage of caregivers. Yes. But if, if they're able to stay in a physical space, you know, with universal design, which is, I know it's a little bit of a planning jargon, then... You, you kind of have that person power to kind of offset, and maybe there is a little garden, or maybe there is, you know, some help with some snow shoveling or house painting or whatever. Yeah. That I, I know this sounds very idealistic, but it also kind of has been proven out in other parts of the world. And I, you know, I didn't live, I wasn't alive in the 50s, so I don't really know other than what my, you know, my mother's family or others who did live through that, um, but the the sustainability and the resiliency of what we're seeing as more intense, more frequent, more devastating, um, you know, climate events, weather events as a result of climate change. Right. You know, we could we can solve this. We really could. As soon as we. Uh Decide that we want to. If we don't mind being inconvenienced a little bit here and there or just reframing what we think of. Correct. Okay. Anything else you want to add to that? Uh, Let's see here. I think uh, the other thing that I would just say about intergenerational co-housing with families is oh my gosh, sometimes you just want to pull your hair out and you're like, you know what, you're on notice, you're out of here. Um, or they might, you know, that, that younger generation might be a little bit frustrated. Well, you, what, are you, what are you doing here? Um, and, and so learning, being able to learn from each other, um, I think is a, a, real, a real benefit to it. Um, I really enjoy the fact that, for example, my adult son um, – he, uh, he cooks, and mm. on days where, you know, things are really busy for my husband or myself, and he's got the time, and he does the shopping and the planning, and he likes doing it. It's not an everyday thing, right? but um, that can be really helpful. Or let's say we want to be gone for a few days, um, and we have a couple animals at home that need tended to or whatever. Right. And, you know, of course, he benefits, too. You know, he's sucking off the streaming, you know, subscription. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't got you trying to tell me he, he's not helping with the Netflix bill. He's not helping with the Netflix bill. I think bill. he got something else, so we tap onto his. But That's you know, fair. Um, it's all in the same house. And, and if, even if you extrapolate this out at the neighborhood level, um, there's some really cool models out there where folks are doing these, like, lending libraries yes. of things um 
So, you know, we all, we're all familiar with the library as a book, you know, with, with books. But take, for example, our local library, they have these make it and take it kits that you can check out to build things and make things. But if you go out to the, like, neighborhood level, um, there are some communities who, uh, I, I want to say, like, in the UK, I read, they call it the sharing shed. So instead of you, me, and our neighbors on either side of us all having lawnmowers and snowblowers and circular saw, you know what I'm saying, all these tools, right? Do how often do, are we using them? That's like, true. I've always thought that, you know, like you edge your lawn once a year. Can yeah. I just can I just borrow it? Right. You know who our local sharing shed is? Huh. Kids and file, because you can go rent that. <laughs> they do. They do for some of those, yeah, for some of those bigger things or whatever. But a lot of us who like get off into you know, we're starting to get a little bit more comfortable and 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 moving forward. It's like, oh, I kinda like to have my own. So when I feel like it, I can just go do that. But true. I find Myself, I mean, my husband and I, we're in a larger four-bedroom home, so when it's not full of other people, um, we're like, well, we don't need all this stuff, or we don't need all these rooms, and and it's like, but it has come in handy when we were thinking about da- downsizing, and it didn't quite work out on that offer on that house that we thought we were going to shrink down into. Right. But but what what does occur to us is, well, there's other folks out in the neighborhood who – Maybe they don't have that. And, yes. you know, we've loaned things out or given things away. It's like my husband is not someone who likes to use a gas mower. He uses one of those old-fashioned little, real, you know, circular real mowers. Oh, he does? Yes, he does. Ooh. But we have a small enough small enough footprint of okay. a yard, you know, but that's his choice. Now, it doesn't look like a pristine, like, manicured, you know, uh, golf course lawn or anything. Right. But, uh yeah, it's it's actually a little bit wild for an urban <laughs> backyard. It's it's pretty interesting, but um, yeah, so it's it's kind of been cool to get to know our neighbors and build those relationships through. Um, I've watched you know neighbors' children, even though I'm like my kids are grown, I don't really want to take care of little babies anymore. But sometimes somebody's in a need, and if yeah. I have the time, that's right. Um, or takes a village exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, co-housing, uh, accidental climate activists um, can be coming to a home near you. If you, you know, you talk to mom and dad a little nice and say, hey, what do you think about me hanging out here for a year or two? Maybe I can help out with grandma or grandpa so they don't have to go to, uh, you know, an assisted living where they're like, you know, fish in a barrel with uh, Delta and COVID, you know, it's just one, one example, right? No, I love the idea. I kind of, I believe in the idea. Um, it's stuff that I've actually kind of thought about in ways like, um, you know, why not just get a big house and everybody just kind of, you know, gets their space and you, you take care of each other. Um, the you key know. is having the escape valve space right right you got to have that you got to have either they got to be able to if, if everybody's getting on top of each other and getting all cr- crunchy right the y or the library or some you know maybe you have a flex space in your attic or some place where somebody can escape escape hatch yes back to the parks yeah all right we've come full circle Yes. Okay. Anything else you want to add? That's it for now. That's powerful. That's powerful. All right. I'm. 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 You've. You've. You've given me pause. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's that time of the show where we start winding it up uh, once again. Um, as I have shared with you earlier, uh, we love, love, love to hear from. The Kosh listeners out there, um, I respond to every email personally. 
uh, take the time. We're always looking to improve. I'm looking for ideas. Who do you, who would you like to be on the cash? Give us some guest ideas. I love guest ideas. Um, businesses out there. Hey, if you want to shout out or something, holler at me, you know, that we, we would love to support and share. If you've got any special things happening, um, yeah, just, just let us know. And you, you can contact us at askthekosh at gmail.com. Once again, that is askthekosh at gmail.com. Even though I'm not going to lie, most people usually just reach out on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook Messenger. That is how it all happens. Okay. So, you know what time it is? It's my favorite time of the show. It is shout out time. All right. Lori, what do you got? Who do you want to shout out? I want to shout out to volunteers. People who don't have to do what they do, um, but they are neighbors or kindness of strangers, paying things forward, helping folks out when they don't have to, and, um, you know, going above and beyond uh, what is societally expected in the whole social contract. I just really want to give a shout out to volunteers because we wouldn't be able to have this discussion. I don't think if it wasn't for folks that are doing things out of the goodness of their heart. This is true. Uh, volunteers make so many things go round um, that we can't come to terms um, maybe officially or governmentally to, to make happen. And you have these amazing people that step up and volunteer and, and move the needle for a whole lot of very important things that, that fill the gaps in our society. Um, yeah, I can, I can get down with that shout out. That's for sure to the volunteers. All right. Um, I'd like to give my shout out to uh, one of my good friends from college back in the day, the old college roommate, uh, Mr. Walter Nelson or Walt Baby Love, as we used to love to call him. And he has started a movement called The Fat Vegan. I have gotten my The Fat Vegan T-shirt. I will be taking a picture and putting that out there on social media here shortly. Uh, but he's doing something different, positive. Uh, he's out here showing these pictures of these vegan yummy, yummy desserts that I love looking at. Um, I'm not vegan, but I'll definitely eat the food. I'm not above it. So um, big shout out to Walt Baby Love and the the fat vegan movement go check it out it's out there um and then you know i was gonna do a series of shout outs but i was just thinking of when this episode is going to get published and so i'm going to only do maybe one of them and now i'll do them all shout out to linda pelkey uh happy birthday out there even though by the time this comes out it, it done passed for a minute uh shout out to mary putzer uh happy birthday to you too and to my baby girl madison smith happy birthday to you i just want you to know you're getting a little long in the tooth there girl i just like to tease her because you know <laughs> young people think they are old at like 24 and 25 it, it makes me smile. They'd be like, they're so, I'm so old. And I'm like, yeah. But here's the funny thing. 18 and 19 year olds totally tell them that. <laughs> so it's so fabulous. Yes. And us real old people, we actually get to dodge the whole conversation. So, so big shout out to all of them. And another shout out once again to the cash for bringing Ludacris and Nelly. Once again, I have been waiting and waiting and waiting for a real hip hop show to come to Oshkosh. And we're not talking about like one decade. We're not talking two decades. We're talking about almost three decades. So the fact that they are coming in the same month, best believe I got these tickets and I am excited. Lori, you got you. Did you get you some? Some Nelly tickets? I didn't. I was still waiting on the whole George Lopez thing, and it kept getting rescheduled. And no, I did not. I'm thinking I'm going to get some from my grandson, though. Okay. Because he and his friends, I think, will totally be down for that. Oh, that sounds like, uh, well, it's going to have it to be an early Christmas gift. Right, because it's in November. 
November? Uh, December 4th, December 4th. Uh, is ludicrous, and I believe Nelly is December 17th. At the Oshkosh Arena, right? At the Oshkosh Arena. Mm-hmm. So, super excited about that. All right. Last and final thing, parting words of wisdom. What do you got for us? Just because you can doesn't mean you should, but I'm going to add to that. And just because you're not required to doesn't mean you shouldn't. That's wise, and that's facts. Love it. How'd you like the episode? Was this a good experience? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sitting there looking at the clock. Did we really go that long? We did. Wow. We did. You know what? I'm chatty. Nah, that's just the kosh. You are a very great host. I appreciate um, this 